Oh my god. Hi! <laughs> I'm gonna put my guest away. So for today, team, we're going to be interviewing Lona, aka Charcuterie Board. <laughs> if anyone can press command guest, that'll give you a little link for her. One of the longtime friends from stream. Crazy. So for 32Q, we asked a series of 32 questions trying to understand our friends on a little bit more deeper scale. How we do that is going through these questions, going back and forth. As we ask these questions, chat is encouraged to have any answers or like any questions themselves. Stop blocking me, Lon. Longtime friend, crack Genshin player, and in addition to the artist, and she's slowly and surely working on some projects that I feel like if I say it, I will spoil it. There is our beloved friend. My beloved, could I ask you to introduce yourself? What type of uh, streams do you do? Of course. Hello, everyone. My name is Lana. I use she, her, her pronouns. Lately, I've been streaming a lot of art, but on occasion, I do stream Genshin Impact, which is big for me, and sometimes games like Tomb Raider or Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed! What's your first yeah. game that you streamed? The first game I streamed was Tomb Raider. It wasn't a stream I was planning. I was afraid <laughs> to play the game, so I was like <laughs> calling my friends I'm like, I'm literally peeing myself doing this mission. Can I call you? Mm -hmm. And so they were like, yeah, can I see it? And so after a while of me FaceTiming them and holding the camera while holding the controller, they were like, set up this thing called Twitch. It's much easier. <laughs> I just imagine you like with your phone and you're like, yeah, guys, I'm gonna go in right now. And I'm just gonna, do you see the controls? Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm <laughs> you know? I know, every oh, time I'd get jump scared, like they had no idea what was going on. You wanna talk about any projects you wanna work on, girl? Oh, I'd mm. love to, thank you. Yes, though. So, so, I have had this story that I've been planning for almost two years now. I've actually mm -hmm. been thinking about this for a really long time. I've been writing plot for it, the characters, getting into the setting, the culture of the setting. As of this summer, I am going to be putting out a webtoon for it. And I'm really, really excited. Chapter one should come sometime late July or August. Oh, wow. You got mm -hmm. a timeline, okay. I know, I'm so excited. It's been so, so much time in the making and I really want to get it out there because I have so much that I want to share about it even if it doesn't like do anything crazy. Like it's my my passion because I've been working on this for two years, like I've said, so. Yeah, the fact that we have a deadline now, I feel like you can always have like dream projects, but if you don't actually like dedicate to the deadline, you can just only stay as a, a dream project. So I'm so proud exactly. of you, girly. Thank Woo! you. I've really loved how the character designs have turned out. Yeah. Um, it's been a lot of fun to create these characters and scenarios and all these twisted plots and how they go. What's having like a the biggest challenge for you? The biggest challenge would be keeping a character on brand because like I have character art for them, right? So I'm always keeping this in mind. I want one character to start out and then mm -hmm. I want them to have growth, but because mm. it's been like two years of me developing these characters in my head i'm like later on they'll act this way oh. so sometimes i have to be like while i'm writing these first chapters i have to step out and be like okay reimagine how they'd respond to that as they are in this timeline i think that's very valuable because if you want to show the growth sometimes mm -hmm. how they behave or like their decision at the very beginning will contrast how they are at the end exactly and, and just how, sometimes even how they treat people exactly seeing it unfold how it impacts others i'm very excited Ooh. i am too oh, i'm so excited and i think another thing that was hard like over the time i've been doing little tweaks to their outfits and I, i'm just like hold on keep it keep it a base set this down and so that's why i was like yeah, this is the finalized. This is the finalized. Like I have the sketches in the webtoon, and even in the webtoon and the drafts, it's different than what I put in the finalized. I'm like these. These are my guidelines now. So I'm making strict guidelines, and I'm following them. Yeah, I feel like once you have those strict guidelines, not only is it gonna be more consistent, it'll start looking like the person. I don't know about yes. you, but when I draw, if I don't draw it like consistently, it just looks like an amalgamation of pieces. But if I want it to be a character, I have to keep drawing the same person. And then you'll see like, yes. oh, they, they they frown a little bit more to the left more. Their, eye, yes. their right eye is like a little bit more expression, expressive. <laughs> Absolutely. Like one thing I've been working on a lot is making sure my characters don't have same face syndrome. 
So I've been like, all right, master this eye shape, master that eye shape, master Mm. how this nose looks. And so getting like the specific features right per character is also something I try to be very mindful of as well as heights and stuff. I'm excited because Clip Studio Paint has this new thing I recently got, Clip Studio Paint. I'm very, very excited to be using it. I know. And they have this feature where you can customize um, models that they have Mm -hmm. and you can like save height and body presets so Mm -hmm. I won't have to worry about like remembering like because I have notes for every character so I don't have to remember like okay seven and a half heads tall for this character five heads for this one so I can just pull that up and it'll be so nice I was going to say like it seems like you have a very detailed archive of each character their history the lore and the potential you know Um, we've gotten their quirks we've gotten enough of a cultural um road for each of them right because regardless of where you travel the culture or subcultures will be very different and how they interact as you kind of travel through them. oh yeah absolutely right and i think that was one of my favorite Mm -hmm. my question is when it comes to like um world building other than yeah what is like what is the biggest challenge in world building because when it comes to web comics it's about that deadlines and making sure it becomes real but when it comes to creating your world What is like the biggest challenge you face? For world building, I think one thing that I really, really focused on is how the culture, the environment they're in affects Mm -hmm. the plot. Because doing one, yeah, doing one thing in one nation, because this is like a story with travel. So like doing one thing in like one country will have different results and different laws depending on where you go. Mm -hmm. So I kept in mind the values, the laws, the system of government that every nation has. Yeah, I have <laughs> I have all that stuff written down and how it influences the characters that are from there and mm. the actions that are received from the characters that are not. And I think that's really important with the world building to make sure that every place not only looks different mm-hmm. in a sense, but also has a different cultural system and governmental system and values. Uh, you have a strong infrastructure in your in your um, you. storyline, eh? Amazing. Yeah. I love to hear that. Would you Thank like you. to be famous? I would have to say no. Really? I feel like I, feel like I would like my work to be known, but mm. like I would like to remain more Anon. That's why I have like a pen name, Fiona Skidmarks. I just feel like everything would be so difficult to navigate because like rightfully people are called out for things that they should be called out for. But mm-hmm. I feel like when it's like in the face of fame, sometimes there's always going to be someone there to cancel you. It's like according to different sections of the internet, some people consider non-binary people transgender. Some people don't consider non-binary people transgender. And I'm not here to like debate that or anything. But yeah. like it's just like simple stances like where they're like, oh, they're not cisgender, but they're not trans or like, oh, they are trans, whatever. Like, like really small things that depends on your own personal perception of things. I feel like you'd be able to like hate comments for and I feel like I would not be able to do that. And just like knowing that like manga creators get death threat for like killing off the character or like on social media nowadays that it would be really hard. I I feel like I I have too much anxiety for that. I would, I would like cry one comment even though I know it's my bad. I will say, I don't think it's like a a newfound phenomenon. I think the medium has changed. Like, for example, it's like, it's called cancel culture on because it's digital platform where it exposes X, Y, Z's, right? But back then Mm -hmm. it would be like against women. And if you think that like you deserve rights, they call you a witch and they stone you or burn you. So it's not like cancel culture is brand new. (laughs) No, I definitely don't think so. I definitely don't think I've just had so much like experience like online because like before I used to like when I was younger, I used to like try to get like words of movements out. And like if I accidentally reposted from like a page that had reposted something problematic, but I didn't know I'd be like in hot water for reposting from them. So I think it's just like oh. maybe like the niche. Maybe I was just around too many weird people. That could be true. You were in the Genshin yeah. world. Um, ciao. Anyway, so I think that's also <laughs> why because I think maybe a lot of these examples because they say like the minor coding or whatever. There's such a huge debate and people get canceled if like yeah. Traveler is a minor or not. And it's just like it's so trivial. <sighs> yeah. I feel like people like that truly don't have anything else in their life. So they want to like be part of a of a mob yeah. in one way or the other. And 
I think that's what I was trying to say. Like, it's very mm. prevalent in fandoms. Mm. And if I were to be I participating in any fandom that I aspired as a famous person, I would, I would be, I would be too prone to looking at those things and getting headaches. I, I think you have yeah. a good head on your shoulders where you can like address issues that are issues and dismiss things that are just stupid. Whereas, mm. like. I don't have the ability to do that. I get I get too worked up sometimes. It I'm comes like, with age. It comes with age. Do you have a secret hunch on how you'll die? I always say, I don't, this isn't my secret hunch. I'll get to it. But I always say that my ideal way to die is choking on really good food. Because in that moment, I get to have my last minutes enjoying a meal with someone and tasting something really, really good. Lana, have you ever choked on food? <laughs> I have. And okay. like, it's a little scary, but like, <laughs> maybe it's just my experience. But when I choke on food, <laughs> my eyes start to split. <laughs> it's the most unelegant way to die. <laughs> Next question. If you could wake up tomorrow, having gained any one quality or ability, what would it be? I think the one ability that I'd want to wake up with, I guess, being faster at doing things. I work at things at a very slow pace, like with my drawings. I feel like I'm very slow when I'm drawing compared to other people and I want to speed it up. And it's it's very strange, I feel like, because I've been drawing every day for years and I'm yes. still, I think, relatively slow. I don't know if I'm just like more of a leisurely person, but mm. for the sake of like getting things done faster, I want to be better at it. And I think I've definitely improved. Like I've definitely improved like with the amount of time I take on things, like I've noticed that, but I want it to get even, even faster. Can I, I want to be a tip? printing machine. Ooh, okay, printer, I see you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I share a little tip or? Of course. Should I not? Okay. When it comes to like getting faster at stuff, it's not about how often you draw, but how often you draw fast. So an example of that is doing 30 second gesture um, exercises. So you look at a painting, uh, you you paint or draw for 30 seconds, that's it. And then you, you, go, you go to the next pose and you go to the next action. You're like, oh, okay. I barely made the face, but I guess, yeah, that's great. I love to see it. Once you get so frustrated that like, oh man, the person beside me is drawing a whole f torso. I barely got the, the shapes in. Why is that? That's how it's I because... felt in art class. <laughs> yeah. It's just a repetition of like being in a fast environment and forcing yourself to not focus on the details, but on the bigger mm. pieces that with our eyes, with like when it comes to art, it just has an impression of the subject that you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. 30 seconds, one minute, um, when it comes to like full paintings or like, it depends on like what you want to focus too. So it's going to be painting, sketching, gestures, stuff like that. Um, but having it timed. So uh, sometimes for my paintings, I'll only spend two hours on it, max, from mm -hmm. the concept to painting, max. Wow. Yeah. But that's why you see like on stream, my art's been getting faster right yeah it really has been where like i struggled to even pick the colors now it's like by habit so once you okay. get into the practice of like okay it's gonna end in like five seconds what else can i put in yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's what helped me i think so. um yeah. yeah that's really good advice because i've i've been drawing but i haven't been like practicing drawing in like this amount of time if a crystal ball could tell you the truth about yourself your life the future or anything else what would it be 100 percent the future i feel like yeah. it's really hard navigating the future definitely when i was younger 100 percent as well the future to see how my transition would go but i think in this terms it's like how my social life and connections would go with my community if i'm able to where i'll be like physically and i moved out do i have good friends that I go out with every day because sometimes it seems like these things aren't possible for trans women to have yeah at least where I am I know in other mm. places like so many guys but like it's hard to imagine because of what I see and what I hear from people and even online there are still like really skewed opinions so sometimes it's hard for me to imagine having a successful like personal life yeah. Uh, no, that's absolutely true, right? Oh my god, that's really difficult. Yeah, I think the future for a lot of like queer folks are is something that like is feels daunting. Um, but I mm -hmm. feel like your experience is just it's just so limited when it comes to a town. 
you know and what a lot of people do is if, like they do waitressing or anything to like pass the time then use their off time to just pursue passion projects yeah you know and like, it's hard um, too oh wow, absolutely also because being trans is so expensive like the cost for estrogen and everything is just like so much and having your these insurance doesn't like depending on your insurance it's not gonna Wait, cover it i just can't imagine how it's like i have asthma and ever since mm. fourth grade i've always needed um inhalers and so yeah. every every two months or so i'll get a refill and with without insurance it's like 40 dollars. and i was like oh man how annoying but wow. with insurance it's essentially free wow right uh, My baby brother. Ins insurance for us isn't like private so as long as you're like paying taxes you got insurance yeah pog pog yeah <laughs> But like that's what it is right like that's the difference of just like oh my god because whenever i visit my family from california they're talking about like oh yeah we're gonna do a check-in with my little kids here we're gonna have to make sure that the copay and then the insurance and yeah. the other insurance has to be like called and connected and i'm like i go to a, like a clinic as if it's a starbucks hi <laughs> i took a number hello my name is this my last name is this yes i've been here before what oh, am i my... here for I love it when they ask, what are you here for? Because sometimes like old people have no audacity. They're like, yeah, I'm here to replace my hemorrhoid cream. Yeah, the last <laughs> one was kind of like, it's loud. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, okay, sounds good. Take a seat, 10, 15 minutes. You go in, or they ask you what's up. And then the doctor is in, prescribes, and then you waddle out. And then mm -hmm. if you're like, oh man, where am I going to take this prescription? There's another store like right behind you where the pharmacy is. And then if they're like, I don't know what the f you're writing here. I'm going to give me five minutes. I'm going to call the doctor immediately. I'm like, I don't have to do it. No, you sit down. Oh, it's good. And then I waddle and sit down. I'm very happy when it comes to like Canadian healthcare in here. Sorry to brag. Sorry. Um, yeah, you should be. You should be bragging. But it, I just never realized how complicated it is until like you hear yeah, you need an you, intricate like, one. Um, mine took six months to book. But before I went to that appointment, I had to a psychologist for a while so okay. she can sign off. Like, so my psychologist and my like primary care doctor both had to vouch for me being trans. So you do need two doctor's notes like over there. And once you get to that appointment at the hospital, they will evaluate you, like you said, to see if you're trans enough to get hormones. My first evaluation, I went to and I failed it because to them, I wasn't serious enough because I wasn't presenting as my gender because I didn't feel comfortable to until I got hormones because I felt it was still new to me and I, I didn't want to experience like right off discrimination. Like I didn't even present feminine until like I've been on hormones for six months because I wanted to have mm. more of the look mm. because that's when I would be comfortable and feel like, because I would get anxiety, obviously. And I feel like, obviously I'd still be anxious when I first came out, but like, I feel like this would be a less chance of me getting hate crimes or something. So you definitely do need to, presenting definitely does help. But yeah, you definitely need two doctor's notes and you need to be with them for a while. You Like I didn't have a psychologist before then. I needed a psychologist so I could get an appointment. And then after you book that appointment, they decide for you. I had to, like that took six months and it was like torture waiting and waiting to get hormones to be then denied because they don't believe you. And then I had to wait for another appointment and it just felt so horrible, like waiting all that time and not being comfortable with yourself that whole time and knowing like that you have to wait that period. I think being trans is hard enough, but I think the moment you realize you're trans and you start freaking out about your gender, especially when you're going through puberty and the changes is like really, really difficult because I remember like mm. going to bed each night since I realized like crying and like wishing like it was all a dream. And like, once I woke up, I'd be all transition and be all over. It's just, uh, it's very difficult. And I feel like they make the process extremely complicated, especially when 
in most cases, you're not getting hormones. So I feel like they make it extremely difficult. And I feel like it's extremely biased because like, obviously I'm trans and like for someone to say like, no, I don't believe you. So they denied me it. It's, it, there's just like a, like a lot of faults in the system. And people will say like, oh, sometimes people come in and they want their kid to transition. So they make them say these things. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's good. But like, can you believe me? <laughs> oh yeah. I think when it comes, like what I'm hearing is that the moment you realize that you were trans is already like a pivotal moment in your life. And then the second yeah. one, unfortunately comes with that is like, if you want to do for it to pre like for the presentation to match in a way, um, you would have to go through the f mess of the healthcare industry and how yeah. you have to essentially spill your whole story. Spill yeah, that is also extremely difficult. It's like um, it's re-traumatizing yourself as, as you go through this process. And so I'm just like, is. holy shit, that sounds you've gone through a lot. Yeah, mm. I would like to add, like, obviously, like not everyone who is trans wants HRT. But if you do yes. want to like you need you need to spill to so many people oh. that you're trans and you need to convince them. Like, it's not enough oh. that you say that this is how they're fe you're feeling. You have to, like show everyone your trauma and you have to do it to like people you've never met and then they evaluate you and it's like really so still deny you super distressing even... exactly yeah. and they make oh you wait God. so long too it feels like you kind of have to like unfortunately milk out the trauma for them to believe you yeah that's not... i'm really sorry to happen but you got the results i guess yeah <laughs> eventually right. yeah eventually mm -hmm. i know there has been like such a huge back and forth like during the Trump administration, during the start of the pandemic, like you could refuse healthcare rights and healthcare visits, or you could, as a doctor, as a nurse, you could refuse to treat LGBT people. So during the start of the pandemic, there was that going on and obviously wow. affected mainly trans people because like, sure, if you're gay, you can like not mention it. It might be in your file, yes, but like if you're trans, there are complications it, like either you yeah. don't pass, your gender marker has not been updated, your name has not been updated, all these complications and like we were left to die. So I simply emphasize with that in the UK. I hear it's really bad and I hope that they do more to protect their children because it's like there there's so much concern Absolutely. and I think people need to understand that like these are things based on science and so it's definitely not a disease in any sort of way. Like body um, dysmorphia is a disease mm -hmm. because people view their bodies in a way that's unrealistic like someone could be really thin and think they're fat yes. and mm -hmm. like the reality is they're not fat right but mm -hmm. the disease is making them think that whereas when you're trans gender dysphoria when you're freaking out because you have a masculine feature it's not that you don't have those masculine features it's you do and you need it to change because it's not who you are inside no i think that's a really like a really good way to how body dysmorphia can affect for trans folk and how it like body dysmorphia is really connected with like the queer community but before the acceptance of queer communities it was associated with eating disorders. So like for a while when people said body dysmorphia it's because like, oh, you know, you have ED and so psychologists will be able to diagnose that. But when it will come to queer um, body dysmorphia, they're like, it's just in your head, you're being, they, they minimize it to a sense of, um, it feels like it's your fault. That pretty much concludes our interview, babes. Oh my God. Thank you so much uh, for being on stream and and allowing me to interview you. You had so much um, that wasn't shared. And I feel like, especially for some new folks who are not comfortable talking about trans topics or never considered it, how um, financially inaccessible it is sometimes and mm. how much of a toll it takes to advocate for yourself in such an institution that is called Healthcare of America. Um, what you've done is impressive because with the support of your family and friends you were able to be that voice and look at you you got invited to be a speaker i hope you lean on to that but i hope you lean more into your passion project and i hope to see more of thank that thank you later on. i definitely will and i can't wait to tell similar stories through it too of what it's like being queer what it's like having this identity I, i'm pouring that into it too as well as these other things and struggling with meeting these beauty standards and struggling with being trans and I think I have one of the main characters trans which I think was really important for me to have to share to the world through a story like that absolutely yeah absolutely thank you so much